Hello, a very warm welcome to everyone joining us today. I'm Akanksha Rastogi, Senior Curator, Programming and Exhibitions at the Kiran Nadan Museum of Art. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome everyone, and we're thrilled to have uh, Judy Prater with us uh, today uh, for her lecture titled Learning Together, Co-Creating Education. You know, with a huge body of work uh, behind her, with three decades of work, one second, just a second. Yeah, with, 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 with three decades of work behind her, she'll speak of her practice today as a student of anthropology and as a curator of textiles museum in the Washington DC, and also her chosen role of becoming a social entrepreneur uh, in Kutch. You know, it's a great privilege to have her, have somebody who's contributed so tremendously to the sustainability uh, of the craft tradition and questioned with her work, the separation between designer and craftsperson. Um, you know, just to introduce her briefly, uh, she's a social entrepreneur steeped in the world of contemporary textile artisans of Kutch. Her work emphasizes the value of artisan designers. Freighter lived in Kutch for 30 years, during which he co-founded and operated Kala Raksha Trust. Uh, many of you must be familiar with this cooperative for women embroiders, um, you know, where she grew, she grew this into Kala Raksha Textile Museum, and as well as uh, Vidyalya, uh, which was the first design school for traditional artisans. And then she, of course, went on to um, further expand and uh, launch Somaya Kala Vidyalya, um, and, and, and the, the kind of curriculum uh, development she's been working on is so commendable. Um, she's the author of two landmark books in their own right, Threads of, in Threads of Identity, Embroidery and Adornment of the Nomadic Rabadis, Rabadis and the Art of the Dyer in Kutch. Um, Judy, thank you so much for your commitment and agreeing to do this. Uh, it is really, really um, uh, amazing for us to have you here, even though online. And thanks for waking up so early. Um, I must, <laughs> <laughs> it's morning for you. And, um, uh, but but uh, this, is, this has been really great. Uh, so today is also the last session of the second set. Uh, of uh, um, you know sessions uh, crafts I mean put together under the rubric of crafting thought crafting thought which has been conceptualized by a very dear amazing um, art historian and designer Anapurna Garimela I must thank you once again uh, for for doing this uh, for us I mean thanks for me personally as well as from the entire team of KNMA it has been such a amazing learning curve for all of us, uh, you know, to be on this journey for the last um, four, four or five months already, actually. Um, so this unique format of um, uh, researchers practice program, um, you know, where we invite a scholar, researcher, or, or a practitioner to then further invite five to six practitioners has been very, very enrich enriching, um, you know, just, just in the way, particularly in the ways that it brings subjectivity in research and the, and the, the way uh, everyone has opened up um, you know, uh, to their journeys, uh, you know, in such remarkable ways. So uh, this is also to say that um, the second set is ending, but we'll be back with the third set uh, in September. And uh, so please um, uh, look out for all the lectures, last 10 lectures, which are already archived on the museum's YouTube channel. Um, so they're actually a tremendous treat. Uh, without much delay, I would like to hand it over to Annapurna to take the evening forward. Uh, over to you, Annapurna and Judy. Well, thank you so much, Akansha, and the colleague at Kiran Nadar Museum and Judy for participating today. And I also want to thank all the participants for turning up. Some of them are repeat uh, participants, and I'm very grateful for that level of commitment and interest uh, to join us for each of these sessions. Uh, there have been a range of people, and I, I want to say something a little bit deeper today before turning it over to Judy, and then we'll focus on Judy's work. Um, I want to say a little, few things about uh, 
the way that I thought about it uh, and arriving at duty, it was, it was sequenced in a certain way too. Of course, some of it was about availability, but also some of it was uh, thought out. So we started with Sankalpa who was um, uh, focusing on materials and uh, bamboo and his deep thought about pedagogy and the body and how to teach students in SEPT in an architecture program, how to think about a material like bamboo uh, at a time when uh, labor and the body, uh, laboring of construction and the body have to be sometimes very thoughtfully put back together. Um, then after that, we had uh, uh, Annapurna Mamiripuri, we had David Blamey, uh, we had Lily Irani, and we had, uh, we have J Judy Frader, and uh, we also had the wonderful Shahid Salim. So all of these people are um, crucial in crucially think out in their work whether they perhaps not as quite explicitly as they did in during these sessions, how to take architecture, how to take emotion, how to take. Um, a desire to be an activist, and that is a desire. It's not something that's, you know, uh, somewhere in a kind of rationalist world, something out there. It begins with the desire to do something, to make a change of some kind, to make an impact, to engage, whatever that is. And also someone like Lily Rani, uh, who's also a uh, professor. She's also a activist. Uh, and not necessarily from the art world, but has thought a lot about questions of innovation. So all of the people in this series are grappling with teaching a particular tradition or a material, um, an emotion, um, and the idea of innovation. And the, 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 the thing that I, it was very important to me is over my time, uh, from the time I was a researcher in Mark. Uh, and then onwards, I've come to realize that India's story cannot be written as though it is India's alone in a very nationalistic sense. India's story um, participates, historically has been a very cosmopolitan, but I'm less interested in cosmopolitanism for the moment. I'm really interested in the diversity of people who came to India for their own reasons and for their own in, emotional engagements to do uh, work here. I'm also very fascinated by people who are from one part of India and go to another. I'm one of those people, which is in a way a foreign country because the language is different and the customs are different and the institutions are different and um, have to, you're just so called to connect it's a calling to connect to something, and uh, you do. So uh, I, I, I really wanted to, for myself, break out of that idea that uh, somebody who is a diasporic South Asian or Indian, or somebody who is um, made India their home in some way or the other, or some people have two homes. I have it in Bangalore, I have it in Hyderabad, and I have it in Delhi. Um, and I also have different backgrounds, can, can think out all these things through their work as they craft their thought in their research as practice. So Judy is very important uh, to the Indian, Indian textile uh, uh, sector, contemporary textile sector. Um, she's already been introduced very well by Akansha. I just want to say that the models that she's going to talk about, the kind of work she's done, has now become so important that institutions in India that were by and large designed to focus on urban people and urban students are now beginning to incorporate serious bachelor level programs for involving and engaging um, hereditary craftspeople. Um, in formal education programs uh, at the national institutional level. This is a, a massive transformation. If we understand the history of design institutions in India, right from the colonial period, the artisan was meant to be educated to be bettered. 
the artisan supported the the work of the fine artist by teaching the fine artist skills that upper caste people, upper class people could never have acquired. For example, how to throw a pot. Um, rarely were institutions set up on the terms that heredity crafts people might make for themselves. Who knows what those terms are? Judy Frader is going to tell us what some of those terms are. But I think the, the story is just beginning to unfold as generations of new generations of uh, students uh, from hereditary crafts communities um, engage, may not necessarily be with the craft itself, but the knowledge that the craft cultivates in their uh, family life, in their community life, and they're bringing it to fields like contemporary art to design, um, to also the practice of the craft itself and how to theorize the craft, how to theorize labor, how to theorize business uh, practices, how to theorize the market. And one of the deep uh, concerns that I have had, and I'm very grateful for uh, Judy to come and present today is, there's a brave new world of marketing that's growing in this country between corporate houses and designers and uh, craftspeople. And this is uncharted territory. Some of it is known and some of it is, much of it is unknown. How are we going to intellect and practice that, that market? Practice being consumers, practice being buyers, practice being, retailers practice being craftspeople, practice being designers, practice being teachers. So thank you, Judy, for engaging us today. And I'm really looking forward, as always, for anybody who's new here, uh, there's about a 45 minute talk. And then we, I will ask Judy a few questions. She's the only person I've met out of all the people in this series. So I'm, I'm pretty ch chuffed about the whole thing. So, um, uh, so uh, I will ask her a few questions and that's just to open up, lubricate the process of all the participants asking questions. And Judy, I request you to ask me a question back anytime that you feel like. A question deserves a question sometimes. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Well, thank you. Thank the um, Kiran Nadar Museum of Art and Annapurna for inviting me. And um, I'm really excited and honored to, to be a part of this. To, um, I, I, when Annapurna first told me about it, crafting thought, I was really excited because I remember uh, as a student, as a, as a young student of anthropology, um, <laughs> I could not at that time find anything about how to do it, right? You always found the results. So uh, I, I really relish the idea of talking about the thought process behind what goes on. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I called my talk Learning Together, Co-Creating Education because I... I think that at heart, I am an educator, and over the years, education as, uh, as a process, a fluid process in which everyone is both simultaneously learning and teaching, and also to think about um, an educator, not as someone who teaches, as, as a sort of didactic kind of um, uh, dynamic, but as one who creates opportunities to learn. And um, I think, you know, what kept me in touch for 30 years was not only, of course, very important, the, the amazing creativity of traditional artisans, but also the feeling that their potential was somehow not fully realized and, and the, the desire to, to do something to help realize it. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to walk you through the process. Um, I'm beginning in New Hope, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. And that is a village really of bohemian uh, designer makers or artisan designers. And I start here because I think that our early experiences really shape our values and our sensibilities. 
So I was very fortunate to be surrounded by basically your baseline artisan designers. Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, I began my uh, long relationship with India as a freshman in college. I was 19 years old and uh, I had an opportunity to go to India, and it was also an opportunity to do research. I hadn't done research before, and I didn't know, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't know how to do research, what was research. So I learned it by doing, um, kind of thrown into the field, and I understood that it was a process of observing and listening. That's really, I think, the, the critical um, point of research. And then uh, formulating questions, observing some more, listening some more, and then coming up with some answers to test. And I was doing this, my, I focused on embroidery. I think when I first came to, to India and I went to Kutch in 1970, I was intrigued by the Ravaris, the, these women dressed in black with very severe demeanors and creating wildly colorful embroideries. And I said, what is going on here? I need to find this out. So that really was the beginning of my research, but I was also learning about anthropology at the time um, and learning about culture. As, uh, as someone doing a study, I was taking, but I also learned early on the importance of reciprocity. So I would give back as I could at the time, uh, photographs, which were pretty rare at the time, um, field recordings of folk songs. And of course I started to collect embroidery. Um, after my undergraduate work, I decided that um, I wanted to share what I had learned because it was so important to me. And uh, so I created an exhibition of Rabari textiles in context. I was hoping to uh, share with people a very different world and make that accessible through material culture. And so I think this was my first time of trying to create an opportunity to learn by experience, uh, although of course it was an indirect experience. And um, after that, I went on to do two master's degrees uh, furthering research on nomadic people, how they adapt and retain their identity. And then, um, yeah, in two parts actually, first as theory and then as um, field work in, again, in Kutch, I kept on going back to India. And after I finished my um, second thesis, the first thing that I did was rewrite it to make it more interesting to lay people. I, I, I always felt that, it's important to share beyond your uh, your academic group to make your your learning more widely accessible. So I published it as Threads of Identity in 1995, and then I um, got a job as a curator at the Textile Museum. It was a perfect job for me, and uh, during my first year while I was um, working on an exhibition of embroideries of India and Pakistan, I received a Fulbright fellowship. And so I had the chance to go back to India, um, do some further work toward the exhibition, but also to test my theory that I had developed working with Rabaris that embroideries are, are a language, a cultural language, maybe a nonverbal language, that um, expresses the history of a people. And I, I wanted to test whether that was applicable beyond Rabaris with other communities as well. So I started studying Suf embroidery. And here I am, you know, in my anthropological uh, mindset, taking notes. And uh, one of the young women uh, embroiderers who I was studying, Diaben, who is in, uh, wearing the light blue in the lower uh, left, she stared at me and she said, why are you studying us? Why don't you help us? And I, again, it's, I think it's listening and hearing. You have to be in the right mindset to hear what is being said. And I thought, oh, wow, why am I studying you? And I said, well, you know, to preserve your culture. And I thought, no, she's seeing it from a different point of view. If, if it is 
uh, and is struggling to survive at the same time I'm studying, maybe there's a, a different perspective. So I began to see from the perspective of the people who I was studying. And um, so together, um, Diaben and her brother Prakash Bhai and I began the Dustakar Kutch project with Laila Tayabji. And uh, um, I think Diaben was thinking about money, getting better wages. I was thinking really what artisans need from having studied their craft in context. I thought it is to retain their creative capacity, their agency, and to enable the uh, continuation of their cultural heritage. But I didn't see those two as mutually exclusive. I thought we could do both together. So that was the idea behind the Dustakar Kutch project. Um, I went back to the US and completed my exhibition at the Textile Museum. And then I got a Ford Foundation grant and came back to India. Um, and at that time, uh, the community that was part of the Dustakar Kutch project, one of the three communities uh, to which Diaben and Prakash Bhai belong, they were not happy working for somebody. They said, can't we have our own? Well, I understood the importance of initiative, of engagement. So I thought that I need to support. So together we started Kalaraksha. And this is at the point I think where my research really turned to practice and um, where I started to think of observing and, and finding where the, the blocks or the challenges were and trying to solve them. And this is maybe in academics thought of as crossing the line, maybe you're not supposed to do that, but it was too late. <laughs> so, um, I think as I was trying to, to uh, solve the problems I perceived, I was also learning from the traditional wisdom of the artisan community and um, understanding how, whether or not they perceived the same problems that I did, trying to balance both perspectives. Um, beginning, of course, with the artisan priority, which is a need for better wages. I thought about design. I'm not trained as a designer. I was trained. I did begin my college career in fine art, but uh, once I went to India, I shifted to anthropology. Um, but um, I started working with design and with finding a, a, an appropriate market. Um, all the while I was looking forward, I kept looking backward trying to use what I had appreciated in understanding traditional craft in its context and, and bring that into a contemporary situation. Um, so I first thing um, got rid of all synthetics and uh, started to look at the traditional work which I had collected as a resource for making new work trying to, to keep that integrity. I started working with, um, in Kutch, we have so many uh, wonderful uh, living arts. And so working with local weavers and dyers who I, you may recognize Ishmael by here. Um, and that enabled um, an infusion into the, the greater economy, the greater, um, community, and it also sort of, as much as possible, kept the, um, the, develop, the, the procuring of raw materials in our control. Um, the museum was very important. I came from a museum background, and I realized that um, having excellent examples was, was essential to the uh, living cultural heritage, living tradition, and traditions are always evolving. That was what my studies were about. Um, and I think this was brought home to me uh, while I was doing my research on soup embroidery. I found two Mokanis that were almost the same, and I was so excited. I, I showed the women in the community, look, look, these two are almost the same. And one woman said to me, right, I copied that one. And I thought, oh, that's how a tradition works. It's, it's, it's not mysterious, it's very organic. And so I thought, yeah, if the 
excellent examples aren't there, a tradition cannot keep on evolving. It cannot keep um, its integrity. So I wanted to, to make a collection available to the artisans. I always have to think why and what for. Okay, why are we collecting what for? This is cultural heritage that belongs to the community. It has to be accessible to them. If it's in Buj, it might as well be in Tokyo, right? So it had to be in the village. So I raised some money and uh, uh, built a community center that included a museum. And I think another important thing, two things go through Kalaraksha, the beginning of Kalaraksha. One is artisan initiative and the other is involvement. I wanted to uh, make sure that there was ownership. So I had the artisans do the research, which was amazing because you don't usually get that kind of um, uh, very detailed documentation in a museum. Um, we had that luxury. And so I engaged them in documenting the textiles, also in displaying them. And so, so it, there was a lot of engagement, a lot of ownership. And it also enabled, you know, we can't say that, oh, you should stay as you are because it pleases me. People want to move forward. Nobody wants to be their grandparents. Um, but by having that uh, small museum there in, in the village in Sumrasar, people could appreciate their heritage while moving on. Um, I began working with education very soon after beginning Kalaraksha. One thing that I noticed was that um, many of the women complained of the same ailments, headaches, anxiety, um, weakness, tiredness, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, um, because it's so pervasive, it's, it has to have some kind of systemic or cultural um, basis. So I thought, let's, let's see how we can work on this um, within the community. And I also thought about literacy because um, one day our Chokidar's son graduated from uh, high school and I congratulated him. I said, oh, your son graduated. He said, oh, did he? And I, I was shocked. I realized that um, there's a disconnect between the generations, partly because the elders have not been educated. So I thought, well, if we have an adult education program, um, at the very least we can find, uh, develop empathy so that the, the elders will understand what their, their, um, the next generation is going through. But um, yeah, and, and so they can uh, also support it. So one more um, observation that, that kind of brought it all together. I was at my friend's place in Delhi and uh, her servant was learning English and he asked me if I could help him with his homework. I said, sure. And uh, I, was, I was just uh, baffled and horrified to see that he was having to memorize a passage about how to make the perfect cup of English tea with the milk separate, the sugar separate, the tea separate. I said, what, when will he ever use this? So I thought, okay, when you're learning uh, to read and write, you can use any material. So I combined education, literacy, and healthcare and, and brought in doctors to talk to the, the um, uh, embroiderer group about systems of the body like I had learned in America and uh, to talk about how they work, what could go wrong and then examine them. So this was also uh, a way of showing people what their responsibility was too, um, how they had to understand and be able to articulate really what was going on. Um, now, as far as design, the, the beginning of involving the artisans in their own design also came through observing um, and listening to artisans. Uh, this on the right is Rani Ben. She is the mother of Prakash Bhai and Daya Ben, a very accomplished at the time patchwork and applique artist. And uh, one day Prakash Bhai and I were sorting some of the patchwork into 
good and not so good piles. And Ronnie Ben watched and she became increasingly agitated and she saw her piece go in the reject pile. And she said, oh, then you just tell me what to do because I don't know. And I thought, oh my goodness, what in all of our good intentions, we can actually succeed in disempowering rather than empowering if we don't engage artisans at the, the very basic design and evaluation level. And of course they know how to evaluate work, right? So uh, soon after that, Harya Ben, who is in the uh, upper left, um, brought a very unusual embroider, embroidery in. And I said, wow, where did you get that? That's, that's not a traditional design. She said, oh, you know, the books. So I had been collecting books for the um, library of the museum and they were waiting to be accessioned. They were piled up and she saw them and opened one and thought this was a good design and just copied it. And I thought, oh, and though this is very simple. I, this hardly needs to be explained. Uh, artisans love to innovate and we just need to create that opportunity. So then we began, I, I began a design committee and both Ronnie Ben and Harriya Ben were of course in the committee. And we would pull out objects and books from the, from the museum collections and have artisans um, innovate from those inspirations. Okay, moving right along. And the same Harriya Ben sometime later called me into the workshop and she said, come here, I have something to show you. And uh, she had made a nice little display of three embroidered cushion covers. And she said, are these all the same? And I recognized that she was giving me a quiz. I said, all right, so let's observe carefully. And I looked at them and I said, well, the, the pattern's the same, the design is the same, but the workmanship is different. And she said, right, so why are they all being priced the same? Well, again, listening to what, what she, where she was coming from, what she meant. Fairness is very important. And, and uh, I thought, yes, we need to, engage artisans in the pricing of their work as well. It's, you know, this was an attempt to, to not have it be so top down. And I have to say that we're working in paradigms. When you're doing research, you postulate um, an answer, right? But you have to keep on testing it. So we began a pricing committee and of course, Harry Eben was the chairperson. Um, and, you know, it was, it was the beginning of engagement, mutual respect, that was very important. There were later on, I realized, problems in that the artisans did not really know the market. They did not have a way to make a really appropriate standard by which to price. But it was a beginning, okay? And it had an important impact in, in developing our, our embroiderer community. Okay, things were going very well with Color Raksha from 1993 to 2001. We had a very steady growth rate. And I think that many of you will remember that in 2001, a, a massive earthquake devastated Kutch and um, everything stopped. And uh, we had to think what to do. And I, I looking back, I remember what a friend later said to me, the artisans always have the answers. I, I thought, you know, I, I, after the earthquake also came what I call a tsunami of aid. Aid came pouring into Kutch and a lot of it, honestly, from the village point of view did not make any sense. Aid came in from the perspective of the aid givers who often didn't take the time to see what what was the situation and what people really needed. And that was frustrating. And, you know, artisans would be given toolkits of tools that they didn't use. And so Prakash Bhai said, let's have matching grants. And it was a brilliant solution um, because I think that people are smart enough to know what to do with money if you give them money. But we wanted them to also earn it. So the matching grants worked like this. For one year, whatever uh, an artisan earned, we would match it from our funds that I was collecting. And 
I think uh, I I learned a tremendous uh, lesson from that because of course people started working more, but they also worked better. And uh, I asked, you know, wow, what, tell me what's happening here. And they said, you're paying us well, we're going to do good work. And, you know, I realized that they're, that people are honorable and they, they understand um, a, a sort of mutual relationship. You do good to me, I'll do good to you. And, and that was, I wished we could always um, pay those double wages. Um, I called it the Stone Soup Project from a childhood story about a community coming together to uh, create for the greater good. I also, before I move on, I want to point out that the image that I'm using to illustrate earthquake here in the upper right is a, a piece that was made by Ronnie Ben, a different Ronnie Ben, Ronnie Ben Bika. And um, as one of the aid projects that we got after the earthquake, I, I was asked to, to have artisans do narrative work. And I refused. I said, that's not part of the tradition in Kutch. That's people do decorative work, they don't do narrative work. And then a second person asked for narrative work. And I said, okay, all right, let's try. And so I asked Ronnie Ben, who had lost her home in the earthquake, to make a very large piece um, expressing her experience of the earthquake. And this was such a profound piece of art that I, I just thought, okay, I stand corrected. They, they do know how to do narrative art. And I, I think back now, a friend of mine has a phrase that she uses, the, the bigotry of low expectations. Don't do that. So we started a, a narrative project and, and I realized that you cannot second guess who's capable of what because not without giving them a chance. So I opened it up. Anybody who wanted to participate could. Here in the upper left, there's a, there's a, a photograph of, um, you know, the artisans had been devastated by the earthquake and here was an opportunity to work and they were they're all very eager and each each person did a unique expression of their experience of the earthquake and then I carried that forward and each year gave a theme sometimes I asked the artisans to give a theme to um, to make a narrative show we would do one show a year in uh, Delhi or Bombay or Bangalore and uh, you know thinking about uh, this introduction of a new type of art, um, Haryaban said to me, it's not that we had nothing to say. He didn't know how to say it. And I think, you know, that's, that's a, a pretty deep statement about, about make, creating opportunities, right? Also, um, what was very interesting is that the artisans understood that this is a different kind of work. And they didn't want to price it in the pricing committee. They said, for this, you give us a price. You, you set the price and give us a percentage, which I think was really a brilliant understanding of, of how to approach a new market, an art market. Okay, throughout all this, lots of wonderful work, but I did, I was still very aware that the wages and status that artisans could reach did not really reflect their knowledge and skills. And all, I was still doing my anthropology research. I couldn't help it. Um, so I, I was watching how embroidery styles were evolving. My, my research had been on historical um, interpretation of the evolution of traditional styles to, to illustrate how um, people over time and space had adapted and retained their identity, right? So here I had the chance to actually see it because I was in Kutch for so long. And I saw that one, one major um, factor was that women now had to work because of inflation, one income was no longer enough. And regardless of what they did to earn money, they had to earn money. And so they had less time to do their traditional embroidery. And I saw that two Rabari subgroups had two very different but equally appropriate solutions to this dilemma. Um, and in the uh, 
the, the uh, photo in the upper left are two of those solutions. In the top part is a Kachirabari solution of um, doing a combination of hand and machine embroidery. And I bet if I didn't tell you that, you wouldn't know. The idea is to retain the aesthetic, but lessen the amount of time. Brilliant solution, okay? In the, the lower left is the Debra Rabari solution, which was to um, use machine application of ready-made elements with the same effect, okay? So I understood that, that they were following a design brief, right? They understood design. At the same time, in Kalaraksha, we would bring in um, young design students to work with artisans. And I, I saw that it was often less than ideal. Um, many times, I think, you know, often the design students didn't bother to ask the artisans what they liked or what they did even. Some of them didn't even look in the museum. And uh, they would just have their ideas that they wanted to have the artisans carry out. And the artisans, as soon as the designers would look away, they'd roll their eyes. I thought there has to be something better than this. And I would mumble to myself, they should have a design school for artisans. But um, it wasn't happening. And then when the earthquake happened, uh, it's, you know, a, 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 a disaster is always destruction and also opportunity. So, um, Soon after the earthquake, a reporter asked me what I hoped would come out of this earthquake. And I said, a design school for artisans. And then I realized that there wasn't a they and that they might be me and that I had to try to do it. So uh, one of our very wonderful funders nominated me for an Ashoka Fellowship, which very fortunately I received. And so I um, did some research on design programs in India and outside of India and, and with a group of consultants put together a curriculum and in, 19, in 2005 began Kalaraksha Vidyalaya, which was what I wanted really was for artisans to retain their agency, to, to learn to innovate in their traditions as they felt appropriate, because I knew that if they did it, it would keep its integrity and, and, and it would just be a new form of that ongoing evolution of cultural heritage. Um, I wanted to make sure that the course was accessible, thinking about what were the obstacles to, there were already design programs, plenty um, by then, and, um, but, but they weren't accessible to artisans for several reasons. One, money. Um, two, language. Almost always they're taught in English. Uh, three, time. Uh, a working artisan really cannot take off a year or two years or four years to, to learn design. It's just not possible for them. Um, so I created a program in modules. I thought two weeks is about the amount of time that an artisan can stay away from home, from their ongoing work, taught in Gujarati or possibly Hindi and with very minimal fees. And so um, that's how, in the first year I observed a lot, you know, what was working, what wasn't, what could be better. And uh, one of the modules is, market orientation, because I knew that it was important for artisans to understand why they needed to innovate in the first place. Now, in the traditional setting, the, the artisan and the client lived in the same community, shared the same standards and understanding, and, and, so, and they knew each other's lifestyles, so that the innovations were very organic and appropriate, and everybody was happy, right? But now, um, that market was no longer viable. And so artisans were aiming for a market that they didn't really know. So we took them to Ahmedabad to see shops in which crafts were sold. Uh, and then during that first year, we had an exhibition at the home of the director of the American Embassy School in Delhi. And it was a day long program. Artisans had to use the bathroom and <laughs> one, one artisan came bursting out of the bathroom and said, a shower curtain, it's a product. And I thought, right, where would he have seen a shower curtain? 
And then I realized that uh, we had to go deeper, that seeing the shops wasn't enough. They had to understand the lifestyle of those potential clients. And then I thought about how in the United States, we have these home and garden tours, which everyone loves. You know, you love to go and see how people live. And so I, I sort of uh, set that up also as part of the course. And um, the students visited various homes um, in Ahmedabad when they went for their um, market orientation trip. And they, they, we, we made sure to have a range. So they began to understand who might be, who are those people that might be buying their work. Um, I also continued over the years to observe uh, and, and tweak the program. Um, I realized that, I th and I think this is way beyond just a design school for artisans in Kutch. I think it's a, it's a part of education. The, the, the real crux of the matter is being able to apply what you learn. And um, so I made sure that whatever was taught was taught in as practical of a way as possible and that it was implemented into ongoing work as quickly as possible. So um, we had homework that was given to uh, with the specific intent of um, artisans using what they learned in their ongoing work. And when I would go to the villages and see what was going on, I, I soon realized that really the, the students in our courses are textile designers. They're not product or fashion designers. And yet we do have to have products. So I thought, well, teaching product design in one year, the program is one year, is not practical and probably not even desirable. Better to... Uh, learn to work with designers. And then I could go back to that less than ideal situation where the, the artisan, uh, artisans were working with urban design students. And I thought, okay, well, let's turn that on its head. Let's invite uh, groups of urban design students to work with our artisans, but we're not going to have them tell the artisans what to do. We're going to have our artisan students engage them to make what they want to make. And so this began a sort of co-design project where we would level the playing field and, and learn to appreciate each other's strengths and work together. Um, another thing that I observed, and again, I think this is not uh, unique to artisans learning design in India. I think it's a part of education, uh, is that the, the family members usually didn't know anything about what their family members were learning in class. Um, and I thought, well, we, we really want to engage the community if we want this program to go forward. So I um, added a family jury to the end of the course before the students meet with the professional jury. And Anapurna was in that jury in 2019. Um, and I'm, I think this is one of the most heartwarming and cherished parts of the of the program for me because um, when we invite the parents it, it just sets up a new new relationship and again um, kind of breaks down those uh, those limitations that we set for ourselves in our preconceptions and so uh, they they watch and listen to their family members presenting in a professional way and there's lots of tears and lots of joy and uh, it's 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 really great and it also has helped the the learning of the course to percolate into the community and has helped to support it um now i wanted this artisan design the 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 aspect of the artisan being the designer as well as the maker to to reach consciousness and be valued and so I came up with the with the concept artisan design, and I wanted a logo. And uh, I in, I contacted a, a friend, colleague at the National Institute of Design, and asked him to um, to make it a classroom project. And the first results came in, and I didn't like any of them. And so I, my my first thought was, okay, this isn't going to work. And uh, this was a learning for me. Um, my, my friend and colleague sat me down, slowed me down and said, 
let's give them a second chance. And I learned the importance of giving a second chance and also my responsibility that I had to articulate what it was that I liked or didn't like, what I was wanting to do. So that was a big learning for me. And we got this really wonderful logo too, second time around. Now, um, I ran the program at Kalaraksha Vidyalaya for eight years. I did spend almost all of my time raising funds because, you know, we were offering a product education to artisans who couldn't pay for it. So uh, we had to have funding to cover those expenses and to have a good quality of education. And so I couldn't do anything but fundraise pretty much. And I realized that the program had reached its limitation in the context of Kalaraksha, but it had not reached its potential. So I um, joined forces with the KJ Samaya group in Bombay, which has uh, 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 Samaya Vidya Bihar University. And together we founded Somaya Kalavidya, which is where the program currently resides. Um, this gave me the opportunity to expand uh, into where I thought I, uh, other needs were. I, I realized that um, people besides artisans needed to value and understand and appreciate crafts. So I started a craft traditions course, a three-week course for non-artisans and engaged our artisan design graduates as the teachers that also, you know, you learn when you teach, it gave them a chance to see themselves as to value their own knowledge. And I began an outreach project where I thought, you know, this, this amazing education needs to go beyond Kutch. And through serendipity, um, became connected to a group in Bagalkot in Karnataka, the Ilkal Sari Weavers. And uh, so I engaged our graduates to be teachers to teach design quickly, kind of kickstarting uh, and basically to understand the importance of design, where what design can mean to you as a, as a traditional artisan in this group and quickly got them to the market. And that group is still going on and doing wonderful innovations in, in Kalsadis. And year after year, we would work with different groups of artisans who had less exposure to the market. Um, and also uh, after joining Somaya and starting Somaya Kalavidya, it gave me an opportunity to start a postgraduate course in business and management called BMA, Business and Management for Artisans. And um, that was because I, I could see that, you know, in the classes, the students did amazing work, amazingly creative work. And yet it didn't always get to the market that it deserved. Uh, the market that would appreciate it. And so I thought, well, at the same time, they, the artisans would say to me, design isn't enough. We also need to know some business. So I started a course with uh, support from Ashoka uh, based on a similar model of modular, um, uh, modular courses over one year. And um, at the time, I found out that my assistant had sort of misrepresented his role in developing the course in order to seek another job. And, oh, this was another big learning for me, a second learning and probably not my last about the importance of second chances. So my first reaction was to, to let it go and maybe let him go. And then I thought, no, no. And I really had to get my courage together and I talked to him about it. and. The upshot was that he stayed with me and we became a very strong team. And um, yeah, it's important to, to give second chances. Okay. Uh, from the very beginning of Kalaraksha Vidyalaya now into Somaya Kalavidya, um, the end point of the course is a fashion show and convocation that had become really popular and also important in sharing with the community the where 
craft can go, that it can be contemporary, that it can be fashionable. And, uh, but in the, the beginning um, situation of Sumaya Kalabidya, we didn't have the land to, to host this. You can see there are thousands of people, who, village people mostly, who come to these events. Um, so again, I had to think, all right, where can we get help? And I thought about engaging the alumni community, the artist and designer community, um, uh, to host the program in, in local villages. And uh, that turned out to be, um, I mean, I think it's important to see what your resources are, right? Uh, that became a very good opportunity to engage the community at a deeper level and to really solidify that alumni group. Um, uh, yeah, mutual support. Okay, now the next thing, I think I was thinking this morning, uh, there's a game that we have in our education in America uh, called, what's wrong with this picture? And that, that's, a, that's a very important beginning for research, I think. It's a, you see this, this picture, usually a drawing, and it looks kind of normal, but then you, you have to look very carefully and find out, oh, where, you know, where's something not quite right, right? So, um, you know, I was, uh, observing the um, the graduates, and they were all doing very well, but they were still they were still facing challenges. And I saw that you know in Kutch, there's a a very um, robust tourism industry, very important potentially for artisans, and yet the same few very well known artisans are benefiting from it. And from that, they are growing because of that. Um, continual contact with um, buyers, right? And understanding, uh, observing and understanding what they need, what they like. So uh, I thought, well, we need to share this wealth and this opportunity, um, how to do that. And I thought back to my experiences in the US where um, Craftspeople in the US and probably in Europe too also struggle to survive. It's, it, um, and one way that they reach buyers is through open studio tours. I thought, okay, we can do that. So I set up open studio tours of Bujodi and Adragpur, both places have large populations of our graduates. And um, that worked really well. And uh, again, I engaged, uh, rather than be top down, I always try to work bottom up. I engaged the, um, the uh, alumni community in developing the tours. And of course they came up with a brilliant solution that I might not have thought of. They decided that each time there was a tour, there would be three people who talked about the process, explained the process of their work, and then at the end, there would be an opportunity to sell. But for the sale, everyone, not just those three, but everyone had the opportunity to sell. And again, they're looking at fairness. They're looking at keeping the community together. And so that has worked really well in opening up the, the understanding that there are many um, creative crafts people in the community, not just a few. And that brings us pretty much to today. Um, now I'm thinking what else is wrong with the picture? Um, I've been very fortunate to come into contact with Ario Klammer, who is a Dutch um, cultural economist. And he talks about a value-based uh, economy and um, also the value of craft. And he talks about a creative craft culture, which is sort of like my, my current Bible. Um, in that creative craft culture, there are three components. The first is a body of creative craftspeople. And when I read his description, I think, wow, that's exactly our artisan design graduates. Super. The next component is a market that appreciates and is ready to pay for that creative craft. And I think, well, maybe not so much. And all along, I think all these years, I thought that I know there's a market, we just need to find it. 
And now I'm beginning in this paradigm to reevaluate and think maybe it's not out there yet. Maybe we need to create it. And um, I think when we think about sustainability, it's a big buzzword now, but it's an important concept. We do need to think about sustainability, but in the broadest sense, cultural sustainability as well as environmental sustainability. And I think you sustain what you value. If you don't value it, you're not going to sustain it, right? So, um, and at the same time, I think we have to acknowledge that I know Annapurna was talking about being consumers. Yeah, but one of the problems, and fashion has been targeted as a culprit, one of the problems is too much production, consumption, and waste. How do we buy better and buy less? And I think um, that's where we have to, to work now, developing a market that will buy better and buy less. And maybe the artisans won't have to produce as much. They can produce less, but better, and still make ends meet. Um, so that's where I'm thinking now. And uh, recently I had a great opportunity to kind of test out uh, this idea. In um, I was invited to be an artist in residence at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, just, just finished the semester. And uh, I taught college students about the values of craft. They learned uh, to, it, all in one semester to, to make craft, to uh, look at craft in the um, textiles we're talking about, in the collection at the university, and then to work with artisan designers in Kutch in co-designing and, uh, and then to create an exhibition. And um, this was, you know, trying to connect um, value and sustainability. My idea was to see if I could um, raise the value of craft in one semester of all of these activities. I think also I was looking at, um, oh yes, I did. I think I didn't mentioned that the third component of the creative craft culture is the intermediary who connects the creative crafts people to their appropriate market. So I was thinking of developing new intermediaries, engaging them. And I think my experience, again, always learning and teaching at the same time in education, I, I think I learned at least as much as the students did. And I saw that there are some challenges in, in my initial foray. And so now my work will be to look at those challenges and analyze them, them and see how I can uh, innovate on this, um, on this concept of developing a new and appropriate market for artisan design. So finally, that brings us right to now, the next phase. Uh, I'm living in the United States for now. And I understand that I will have to be an intermediary between creative crafts people and, uh, and a, a new market. Uh, I'm thinking of how to do that. I've started an enterprise called Textiles Live and I just published um, The Art of the Dyer and Kutch. I will be publishing another book. Now the manuscript is due in January and it, I think, I don't know how long it will take the publisher to get it out there. Um, and I'll be doing a tour in November to try to engage people in, in um, I'm creating an opportunity, right? To learn, to interact with artisans and appreciate that there's so much more than just skill. And also I think to focus on, and I hoped, I had hoped that the pandemic would help us to, I mean, again, looking at something good coming out of a terrible disaster, um, to, that we can begin to value more the importance of human connection and craft, uh, if nothing else, embodies that human connection because you're not just buying a product, you're buying, a relationship, you're, you're connecting to the person who made, I know who made my scarf and who made my dress, right? So that's where I'm going. And I think I'll conclude here and hope to have some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy, for um, such a wonderful, uh, coherent and quite candid presentation. Um, 
that was that was superbly enjoyable. So I just want to begin by asking, um, when you first came to Bruch, do you remember how fascination turned into I must do something? Oh, I think uh, that came later, I guess. I mean, first, I, my first phase was absorbing and learning and understanding. And I think it's important, I, I think I forgot to mention this, but it's important in your observation not to make judgments, not to try to, especially when you have two different cultures, two different perspectives, not to observe it from your value system and your orientation, but to try to understand it holistically. I think one thing that I learned about anthropology is whatever exists, exists for a reason. You know, you, you, you can't, can't say this is wrong. This is stupid. You know, um, it's, it, it, it has its reason for being, otherwise it wouldn't be. And um, to, to understand that, right? So, um, yeah, for a long time, I didn't want to. Um, and also as, a, as, you know, in the academics, you're not supposed to get too involved, right? I didn't want to intervene. But then later I started to see, well, there are problems, right? There are problems, even from the, the point of view of uh, the culture that you're studying. So it was an evolution, yeah. No, I feel um, academics intervene all the time when we um, write books that are deeply uh, evaluative and then perhaps even deeply judgmental. Uh, there's a period in which uh, the way that academic writing now often works is that you have some space where you judgment, you pronounce judgments on things, and then uh, there's a space where you step back from those judgments. Um, you know, you're kind of mediating your own uh, uh, the presentation of your involvement. Actually, that's what I what I think. Uh, how how did you um, actually come to think about writing then in that process if you're not interested necessarily in a very academic kind of, why was writing important to you? To share, I always want to share. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I think um, when we practiced, I told you about this, when, when I, when I uh, did my second master's degree, it was because it had a non-thesis option, but by the time I got there, unbeknownst to me, they had stopped it. So I had to write. And um, so, I, so I asked my professor, okay, let's get this over with. There's lots of styles of writing. No, he said, it's gotta be academic. So, you know, I wrote it and then he told me it was dry and boring. So uh, I rewrote it and that was Threads of Identity. I, I think it, I, I always want to reach beyond the, you, you know, not preach to the converted, not not only talk within the circle, but to to if your research is important, it deserves to be uh, available to other people, right? And I also like writing as a craft, as as an art form, right? So my intent is to write in a way that's enjoyable and all sort of like Sufi stories where you, learns you're entertained but you also wow you learn something and and when you recently told me in one of our conversations that you've written a memoir of your time in india what is what is that doing for you what is what is going back over these 30 years well i know this talk represents one way of going backwards but uh that memoir is a, a different thing I mean, how has India changed you? Who were you then and who were you, who are you today after 30 years of this work? I can hardly remember who I was before, but um, you know, I think I've been so enriched by, by being, I feel honored to have been allowed into the communities of artisans, really. I mean, trust is a big, big issue, right? When you're trusted, I, I, uh, then you can hear what people are really thinking. And I think, you know, then, then you, cause look, if you go in as a researcher, you know, and you have your questionnaire, people are going to give you 
two types of answers. They may be the same too. One, what they think you want to hear. Two, what's going to get you out of there as fast as possible, right? And, uh, you know, I, th all right, for example, you know, I would go, I had a research assistant when I was doing my research with Rabari's in 1983-84. And I would um, go into a community and ask the same questions every time. And my research assistant got so annoyed. He would answer. He'd say, you already know that. Here's the answer. And I'd say, no, no, I want to hear it from them. Because once in a hundred, you're going to hear the real answer, right? Or if you forget about all that, you stay overnight, hang out with them, then you're going to hear the real answer, right? So many, okay, for example, dare, dare I even expose this, but, you know, Rabaris are vegetarian, they keep animals, right? It's to their advantage to keep the animals alive. And one time after so many years, I went to a Rabari wedding and they said, do you want kara kamita, salty or sweet? And I said, what's that? Kara is, they were eating goats. Oh, so, <laughs> right? But it took me many years to hear that answer, you know? And I think, you know, a lot of times you look, I'm, so, I'm sorry if I should, shouldn't say this, but you read things, you know, uh, academic works and you think that's not correct. It's because they didn't spend enough time, you yeah. know? You, you've, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about learning language. And you had a research assistant in the beginning. And this is a struggle I think that many, many people are going through today as English has dominated education so profoundly. Uh, how do you grapple with doing the kind of work you do? Um, and how do you think about language? But one, one PhD researcher asked me once if I thought language was important and I almost fell over. Uh, you know, again, you're, if, if you have an, uh, an English speaking interpreter, they're going to tell you what they, oh, here, I'll, I'll show you this. This is hilarious. Um, this is just one little example. Um, there was a, someone, we engaged someone to, um, to do a um, value-based uh, assessment of our 15 years of design education. And this person actually is a, um, worked with Aria Klammer and he has a PhD from uh, Netherlands. And so, I, and we have it on tape and he's going to meet this very imposing Rabari woman, you know, wearing the black. And, and he says to her um, in English, you know, I'm so-and-so and I've done my PhD and I'm working on uh, cultural economics and the values of craft. And, and she's looking at him and looking at him and he has an interpreter, right? And she, she finally says, she cuts him off. She says, what did he say? And the interpreter says, he's a teacher from America, <laughs> right? So that's the kind of, you know, interpretation you're going to get if you're not listening. Um, if you if you don't know the language, right? And and there's different levels of language, right? There's and when I was studying, I studied Hindi. Uh, my teacher said there's there's the third dimension of language, which is the cultural dimension. You can learn, you know, the grammar and the syntax and all, but if you don't have the cultural uh, component, you'll miss some stuff too. So, language is very very important. So when you when you do you ever think in Gujarati sometimes? Yeah, sometimes I dream in Gujarati, <laughs> and I make the same errors that I make in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you think about craft, do you think about it in English and or do you think about it in Gujarati? Well, it depends on which aspect of it, I guess. Yeah, I mean there are certain you know like. In any language, there are there are certain concepts that are not translatable to another language. You you know, um, you can approximate, but not really. And so that's why you have to really to understand it in its in its cultural context. And if you do you see yourself doing uh, 
a project like this with another? I mean, you've worked in one region for so long and you work so diversely. And now you're back in the United States and you, I see you showed us in your last slide the kind of projects you're um, doing. How does it feel for you to have had this massive intellectual commitment, professional commitment, uh, political commitment to it's a political work to um, work with communities of people to um, help them think about their economics, their finances, their identities, their work to be back in America. What do you see? Uh, do you see it as important to contribute to America in any way? Or is that, uh, I, I know the teaching in Wisconsin itself is a commitment. So it's not like I'm not, I'm not seeing that, but it, have, is your, are you actively thinking this through in any way? Well, I mean, I, I do, you know, that there's nothing like that immersion, that intense, passionate immersion that uh, that's not going to America's pretty flat that way. And then, um, <laughs> I think that, you know, understanding the values of handwork is really, it is an important aspect of sustainability. It's more of an intellectual exercise for me than a, than a heart exercise. Um, but, and also I don't at all think that the international market is the end. I don't at all. I think the domestic market is, is, is really what's important. But um, I think if I can do some experiments here, maybe it can carry over. And as you know, oftentimes, you know, people are, are mad to uh, emulate the Western world. So, um, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, um, I'll it's give a, it a try. Yeah. It's uh, a work in progress. It is. And it's a very, I mean, it's such a big, big project. I can only hope to make a little dent in it, but I also, I like to work small and, and deep. Um, I think, you know, I could have done a bigger design school, but it wouldn't have been as e effective. I, I think, um, a lot of times when you get too big, things fall between the cracks and they lose their relevance. I'd, I'd rather see. Hmm? Yes, so, so sorry to interrupt you. Please continue and then I'll ask the question. Well, that's why I didn't see, you know, the, the expansion of the design education program as being a bigger institute. No, but having, you know, outreach projects within the cultural context, right? If you would bring those uh, Karnataka weavers to Kutch, they wouldn't learn as much. It wouldn't be as important to them. It wouldn't be as real or relevant to them, I don't think. Um, so this, the fact of bigness, um, I would wonder if you're following what is happening in the Indian craft and design sector that many, many designers who, let's say, came to their um, career out of NID in the 80s and the 90s are now um, selling they're, they're aging, of course, and they're selling their uh, uh, design houses, so to speak, to large corporations. And um, the large corporations are constructing a new kind of boutique uh, space for themselves to enter into. And I was in Jaipur and speaking to a wonderful Rangres, a dyer. And he was talking about, he can make a 48 colored Lehriya sari and sell it for somewhere around 35,000 rupees. And he can reduce the number of colors and that would be on silk. And he could reduce the number of colors. And there are these doors now, these new kinds of corporate owned craft stores that are squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. so what he's first asked to produce something for 3000 and now they want you to say do the same thing but give it to us for 1200 and do this many more so i'm very curious you've already spoken about like less and better um, what would be the i'm not asking you to criticize this but i'm asking what would be the lure of this for any craftsperson to participate in such a uh, um, structure 
of production. From my understanding from, you know, and, and I will talk about artisans who have gone through the design program and have developed a lot of self-confidence and a lot of broad perspective. Um, the only lure would be to, to make some money. And, um, uh, you know, I, I even say the, the folk art market here has also connected to a wholesale market. And I, I said to the person who I was talking to, I don't even understand that. Because if you're trying, look, it was industrialization that forced craft to go from the local market to a, a, a more distant market, right? And if you're trying to force craft to emulate industry, what is the point? We have industry. We have industry to make things fast and cheap. That's not what craft is. That's why I'm talking about the value of craft. What is the value of craft? The fact that it is handmade. And Christian Koch, who you probably know, years ago when we were starting Color Aksha, he he had this anecdote that there was a, a craftsperson sitting on the footpath selling handmade toys. And a tourist came by and said, uh, "What's how much is it? And he said, 50 rupees. And the tourist said, what if I order 100? He said, then it would be 150 each. <laughs> right? Because that's not what craft is. And wh why should we try to make craft into industry? We already have industry. Why not appreciate what makes craft unique? Uh, and it is that personal connection. And, you know, I, 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 I'm... I'm distressed actually seeing that Adruk artisans are making thousands of meters of Adruk. Why? They're, they're turning people into machines for, for, for what reason? Do you have an answer? <laughs> well, I don't have an answer. What is, it that, what is it that people want if they don't understand what it is? I think it's a visual. It's wanting without valuing. Yeah, it's a one thing without value. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I I I would like to think of craft in different ways. Um, so one is craft in the way that we think of it as a kind of technique or a kind of product or something that's tied to hand. Uh, in this series, I've tried to articulate that crafting can exist in multiple modes. So for example, you could even be very thoughtful and very deeply committed to crafting an algorithm. Um, and that would be a kind of crafting, uh, crafting education, crafting thought, right? Uh, so uh, I'm hoping that conversations like these, even if it touches one person, is to say, where do I want to see, how am I crafting myself through these objects? How am I crafting my thought about the world, the, the products, the things I wear, the things I buy? Um, how am I crafting life livelihood by the way I'm approaching this? These are very profound questions that I don't think lots of people have the time and wherewithal to always raise. Uh, crafting requires slowing down. Craft is slow. It's not fast. And actually contemplating craft requires a lot of time for me to get around craft um, in my own head has taken me since my childhood. I grew up as I've shared with other people in this things. I grew up in an India where girls were taught to make things. And I was born in 1966. We were taught to make samosas, stitch falls, some modest amount of sewing, um, you know, rangoli, flower garlands. There's just tons of stuff. But to move from that to understand craft as something that is beyond the domestic, that there is a very, uh, commercial aspect to craft. And I mean commercial in the sense that people sell and trade in things. There's a trade in craft. And then moving from that to thinking about the historical transformations that craft has gone through, which means that um, craft is made in one place, it's made in Africa, it ends up in America because of the slave trade or um, or there, there's colonial um, sort of 
desire for crafted objects and they bring it to different places or craftspeople themselves were taken to other places. I, I don't know much about this, but I heard that, for example, goldsmiths from India went to um, Spain and Portugal in, in a certain era. Uh, so that way of thinking about craft and then craft thinking about craft as being something profoundly local. It's not a dichotomy, actually. I think that craft is produced in a certain way at certain moments and in certain places. And, you know, the Mughals loved craft people from Azerbaijan or Armenia, and they brought these carpet weavers all the way to um, central India. Uh, so my sense of how to think about craft is really profoundly evolving and deepening. Um, and these conversations have, have further helped me engage with that. But I do think out of all of what I've learned is to contemplate craft. It's not just skill. It's not just product. It's not just place. It's not just geography. It is not just um, uh, uh, embodiment. It is not just, uh, it is all these things and so many other things. So to get my her head around all of this, I take it piece by piece, um, bit by bit. And that's where this series has come out, actually, to see people actively thinking about how they're crafting their practice, helping me think about how to that craft practice. And it's a conversation I want, I'm very grateful that I got to share with this uh, audience that's been turning up to these talks. Judy, it's now uh, 8.31 and our time is up and I don't see any further questions. Uh, I want you to know that many, many people are accessing these talks um, on YouTube and on other through other avenues and they're being used in teaching exercises and in classroom situations of, uh, of learning situations of a variety of uh, uh, of different kinds. So whatever you have shared and uh, we have talked about has a long shelf life. It's good, it, very good. It's like a good piece of craft. Yes, it should be. Uh, you know, I you know when I started my course with the students in Wisconsin, the very first day I asked them to think about something that they have that they will never throw away. And I'll tell you. One interesting thing, it did. I gave them two minutes. It didn't take them two minutes. They all knew. And I said, the reason I'm asking you that is because value is related to sustainability, right? And it all had to do with something personal. Yes. All of it. Yeah. So we I know who made this and I know he's no longer living and I treasure it. It's one of the first he was doing clamp dye before anyone had thought of it. And I know who made this and I know what her inspiration was. And so, you know, that makes this work important to me. I don't need a whole closet full of dresses if I have a few that I really love. That's right. Thank you so much. And Akanksha and the participants and the team at Kiran Nader Museum. And most of all, you, Judy. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I wish you all the best. And I know we will be in further conversation in the near future. Yes, I look forward to Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Good night to everybody and good morning to you. Thank you. Okay. Bye.